The Lost Art of the Short Game with author Carl Morris, episode 855. This is Golf Smarter. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter podcast, Carl. Hi, Fred. It's good to, uh, good to see you again. You, you look younger every time I see you, which is a reflection of the <laughs> place that you live. <laughs> no, it's just a reflection of the light, I think. <laughs> but thank you. That's very kind. Um, really enjoying your book. Um, you guys uh, have had, you and Gary, Nicole, have had multiple books on the lost art of golf. And the latest one, The Lost Art of the Short Game, is... Um, it's not about swing mechanics, is it? It's 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 definitely not about swing mechanics, Fred. And uh, we we both, me and Gary, have said that uh, we've we've written three books now: the lost art of the short game, the lost art of putting, and the lost art of golf. And we promise that's it. Now we're not going to do a rocky. There's not going to be a four or a five or anything <laughs> like that. We're, oh, uh, we're, that's we're, disappointing. We're, we're we're, fin we're finished now with uh, with with, the, with what we've had to say. But yeah, there's been there's, there's been a great response, Fred, over the last few years to it, and I think it's. It's kind of a lot of people connected some dots, really, where they they've realised that they've there is science in golf, and the, and there's the application of science, and that can be very very beneficial. But when you're out playing golf, when you're trying to hold putts, when you're trying to play subtle chip and runs and things like that, surely it's about engaging a little bit more of the artistic, creative side of your brain to create golf shots. Because ultimately, at the end of a round, they don't ask you how many swings you've made; they ask you how many shots you've played. And, and, and every single shot, whether we like it or not, starts in our brain. So we, we've tried to sort of really focus on that, the, the, the more creative element of the game. And people seem to really resonate with it. Well, you know, it's interesting because what, this is episode 855. I've had so many conversations. And it feels like I'm just starting to understand this stuff. Mm. And when you say creative... Um, it, it now it's resonating with me in a way that it never has before. And I think it's only been the last couple of episodes in these conversations that I've always thought about the mental game and the importance of the mental game, which was why this show was launched initially was for me, it was always about how you react to the bad things that happen on the golf course. But what I'm starting to understand is the mental game has a lot to do with striking the ball and and everything leading up to the moment of striking the ball. This is all new to me. So I'm understanding the word creative in a way that I never have before. Yeah, it, it, it is right because, you know, when you look at any golf shot that you, you'll ever play or have ever played in your life, there's, there's three parts to every golf shot. There's, there's what you do before the shot, the way that you think, what you process in your mind before you actually step into it. There's what your attention is on when you're actually over the ball and you make your golf swing. And then, as you say, there's how you react to that shot. Now, the whole of the golf industry tends to focus on the middle bit when we actually swing the golf club. Now, I'm not dismissing that part of it. Obviously, that's a huge element. We've got to develop golfing skills but I come back to that point that I just made earlier that golf is unique in the sense that it's the only sport that I know of that we're not actually looking where we're going in the sense that when you throw a ball at a basket, basketball, you're looking at the hoop. You know, when you throw a dart, you're looking at the board. With this game, we're actually looking down at the golf ball when we're trying to send a ball to a target. So the creation of the shot before you step into it the way I like to say to players is you need to create a map, a clear map for your body to follow. And if you don't create a map, don't be surprised if you get lost in the, mm. in the sense that the shots that you play will be varied at best if you're not creating a rich map for your body to follow. You know, we talk a lot about intention and attention. Having a, a really clear intention one of, the, one of the questions that, that Gary and myself say to players that you can use is so powerful is just to simply ask yourself, what does a good shot look like? Now, by asking that question, what does a good, a good shot look like? Your brain goes into a mode of searching and it comes up with a plan. You, you come up with a shot. Once you've got that, you've got a clear intention. This is the shot I intend to play. Then you can decide with your coach where you place your attention 
in terms of your golf swing to actually make that intention come true. So the, the mental game can be so complex and so, so sort of multifaceted. But if you work on intention, attention and attitude, the three parts to each shot, you're never going to go too far offline. Right, right. It fascinates me, though, because once I learned how, and this was, again, it was just recently, learning about external focus mm. and making the choice to think of something other than what I'm supposed to do when I'm swinging the club, is, it seems very small, but the effect is so great. Yeah. And I, I hope I'm on to something good because... Uh, and we'll talk about this later because you have a workshop about this, but here I am, uh, 67 years old, approaching 70, and I'm playing the best golf of my life right now. Really? Yeah. 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 I mean, the it's not because I'm hitting the ball farther than I ever have. No. I mean, the, 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 the research is really clear, Fred, that, you know, Gabrielle Wolf and people like that have, have long said, said that, if you're going to have a focus, to have an external focus of attention rather than an internal focus is probably the best way for many golfers to get the best out of the game. It seems that when we go to an internal focus, basically telling our bodies what to do, the command from brain to body gets a little bit distorted at best. You know, again, to reiterate the point, Every golf swing is, is a communication from your brain to your body, to your muscles. Muscles don't have a memory. Thank you. M muscles muscles <laughs> do not have a cognitive function. The, 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 you know, the, the best way of looking at it is that when you send a command from your brain to your body, it's like a series of motorways. It's like a series of highways. And you want a clear run for the cars to go along. Now, it would seem that an external focus is a good way of emptying the motorway, so you've got a clear run from brain to body. When we start to think about turning hips and ground reaction forces and you know swing planes and all that kind of stuff, for many people, that puts too much traffic on the motorway and it distorts the message from brain to body. And everybody has had shots. They can remember them distinctly that are like, okay, that was the shot. That's what I'm trying to create. When people are talking about consistency, that's the shot that I want. Mm. But so, you know, it's in there, you know, it's, it can happen. So thinking about all those elements about your elbow, your wrist, your body, your feet, your thinking about all those things while you're making the swing is just a distraction is just noise. That it's hurts. just not, it's just noise and it hurts your game. And I think, in many ways, Fred, we ask the wrong questions with golf mm. in terms of instruction because people go for a golf lesson and the fundamental question that they ask is what's wrong with my swing? Now, when you ask the question, what's wrong with my swing, unfortunately, you're going to get an answer. <laughs> and that, that, answer, <laughs> that, that answer will be in the form of somebody's opinion on how your golf swing looks as, as, a, as an overall form. And, we're ba and it's based on how your golf swing looks, dependent on somebody's model that they have in their head about how a golf swing should look. If we ask the que if we ask, and you never get to an end point with that, when you ask the question, what's wrong with my swing? We never get finished. We never get done with it. There's always something else to work on. But if we ask the question, what's wrong with my shots? That is a completely different approach. Now, I think there can be a wonderful collaboration between the player and the coach because, okay, what's wrong with my shots? Okay, there's too much curve from left to right, right to left, too high, too low, whatever. So if we, if we have a specific intention to shape the ball in a certain way, now we can collaborate with what we need to place our attention on to produce a better ball flight. So we can tune much more into what we need to do with the golf club to inform the golf ball. But it comes back to what is the shot? You know that that wonderful book that was written many years ago, Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. One of the habits was begin with the end in mind. Mm. We don't do that with golf. We actually get we get we get lost in the middle somewhere because the the end of every golf shot is a sh the end of every golf swing is a shot, clearly, or right. a putt or a chip. 
So what is the end? What am I looking to get the golf ball to do? And then let's work back from there to what I maybe then need to do to inform the golf club and golf ball to produce that shot. But it, for me, Fred, it, it, it radically changes things. When you stop asking what's wrong with my swing and you start asking what's wrong with my shots or my chips or my putts, then the, 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 the gates of heaven potentially can open for you. <laughs> Listen, we're going to take a time out right now, um, but I had some follow-up questions with that. So hang on, and we'll be right back after this. When you, when you say, you know, what's wrong with my shot versus what's wrong with my swing, the thing that, that kind of jumps out at me is let's avoid worrying about the results. Let's, because, you know, we've had all these conversations about it's the process, not the result. Let's not worry about what the score is going to be in your card at the end of this hole. So, you know, even though we want to think about the result of the shot, we don't want to get too far ahead of where we are. Is that, am I missing something on that? No, I think, I think that's a, a, a great way of looking at it because, again, to, to sort, of, sort of switch topics but tie into what we've said, what is it that causes so much anxiety with most golfers, Fred, is, is, is the score. Obviously, we go out, yeah. we've got a handicap, and the problem with the handicap is that straight away we feel like we're losing something every time we drop a shot, we have a double bogey, or whatever. We'll lose, we're losing something against our perceived ability of 10 handicap or 15 handicap or whatever. You don't have to play that game in the sense that that game will play in the background, whether you like it or not, the par score of what you shoot on a particular hole. But what you could play is different games. You could play different games whereby you score your process before the shot, or you process that you create a score in terms of your reactions after the shot. So actually, when you look at it, if you were to score what you do before the shot or what you do after the shot, you're now focusing on two things that you can control. The middle bit, nobody in the history of the game has managed to control the golf ball 100%. You know, <laughs> Mo, Mo, Mo Norman got close, Ben Hogan got close, Tiger was for a while, but nobody's got there. No, nobody's eliminated poor shots. But yet, we invest so much of our mental energy on the outcome of a shot in terms of the score, that's why it creates so much anxiety. So if you, if you could build a process, and there are many things that you can do with this, if you could build a process where you were scoring your pre-shot and your post-shot, now you're in a locus of control that you can do something about. Now, it doesn't guarantee that the score score is going to be better, right. but my, good, my goodness, it gives you a better chance. It really does. I, I'm blown away these days of how, you know, um, how it's impacting my game by stop thinking about these things. And stop worrying about these things. Um, I mean, I just completed almost four complete rounds with one ball. And I really think this has a lot to do with it. it I told this story on the episode recently, but I went 71 and a half holes with, <laughs> with one ball. But my final approach shot went in the water, just missed it by very little. But still, that to That's me was great like... Effort. I, that's it. I was going to put that ball. I, I was telling myself one more shot. No, I didn't tell anybody else. One more shot. This ball's going on the trophy cabinet. Face, yeah. Four consecutive rounds with one ball is pretty amazing. <laughs> um, and, and I want to actually, you mentioned a minute ago about Gabrielle Wolf. Have you had her on your podcast? Do you know Gabby? I've not. I've not no, I, I know of her work. And because she was on, her. we had her on a couple of weeks ago. And her yeah. partner, Re Rebecca Luthwaite. Yeah, I mean, she's been researching this stuff for 20, 25, 30 years. 30 years, yeah. Pre pretty pretty adamant that most people would benefit from a an external focus of, of control. And it blew me away. And I was kind of reluctant, like, really, do I want to have kinesiology professors, you know, doctors of biokinesiology on the show? It's like, and I, I walked away from that episode like, oh, my gosh, something finally clicked. And it was, and it was as simple as when I asked, you know, it's like, well, how do you, how do you avoid it? And she said, it's a choice. Just it's a choice. Make the choice. It's like, uh, uh, that's simple. But again, think about what we do with golf, Fred, where most things that we buy, if you buy a computer, 
mm-hmm. or you buy uh, you know a new TV or a, fo- uh, a phone or something like that. All of those things come with a user's manual. <laughs> you get instructions of how to use these things, and you know probably a lot of people are like me. They don't they, they, they ignore the instructions at first and press a load of buttons and see if they can do it themselves and then make a mess of it and then they eventually go back to the user's manual to find the, the right way to use and implement. We buy a set of golf clubs and the golf clubs don't come with the user's manual. <laughs> So so, that's fairly funny. It's so true. It's true. It's true, isn't it? And you can't even call customer support. It's like these clubs aren't working. (laughs) And and you see, every golf swing that you see, every chipping action that you see, is a result of how that person that person has a concept of how to use the club in their hand. Now, unfortunately, that concept is usually wrong Mm -hmm. because. People, when they start to play the game, don't understand that to get the ball up in the air, you don't get the club underneath the ball. You use compression and the loft of the club produces the flight and all that kind of stuff. But when we have a clear understanding of how to use the tool in our hand, then that external focus and that communication from brain and body is so much clearer because we, as a species, we're designed to use tools. We're all pretty good with pens and scalpels and hammers and things like that. We, we, can, use, we can use tools because we know what the tool is for. With golf, most of the time, we don't really understand what the tool is for. You know, like the, like the short game. If you, could, if you could get most golfers to clearly understand how to use a wedge, what the bounce is for, and using the back edge and all of those kind of things, that the, the chipping action would be transformed because they're now using the tool in the way that it's designed, not in the way they think it's designed. So true. Um, who have your mentors been? Is getting you to this point in your career as being a, 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 and do you consider yourself a mental game coach? Yeah, I would say performance coach. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's 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 hard to put a title really on what it is that I do. I just try and get people to play better golf. Right. Um, probably the biggest influence has been Fred Shoemaker. I spent really? time out. Yeah, I spent time out with uh, the school way back twenty odd years ago. Um, Mike Hebron's been a big influence, but lots of lots of people from lots of different areas. You know, I, I studied. Uh, hypnosis for a long time. There's a guy called Milton Erickson, who was a, uh, an incredible communicator, and I studied his work and the way he used language and the way he used words to create images in people's mind. I think every golf coach would gain some benefit from studying hypnotic language, of, of understanding how you can use words to help people create images in their brain that allow them to play better. Because I think when ple- people play good golf – that they're entering into a kind of hypnotic state in the sense that the, you know, you had Izzy Justice on a while ago and I've spent a bit of time, you know, communicating with Izzy and we seem to compare notes pretty well. And as he would talk about, you know, you, people play good golf when the brainwave frequencies are lowered and you're, you're operating more from alpha and theta. What, what is a hypnotic state? It's a lower brainwave frequency. What creates lower brainwave frequency? It's more image-based rather than language-based. Right. I did send you the stuff from Izzy on Jira Golf, right? Yeah. Yeah. Some great, great information. It was, yeah. it's interesting to bring these scientists and doctors into this conversation, which I think for a lot of golfers, it might be a bit much, but for someone like you and a student like myself, it's like, oh, there is science behind this. It's not just guys who are really good at golf trying to share their knowledge. I've I've probably done upwards of a thousand seminars, Fred, over the years at golf clubs around the UK and in Europe and places like that and in the States. And one of the questions that I'll always ask the audience before we start is, I want you to think about the best golf that you've ever played in your life. Go back to that day when you played your best golf and think about how you were on the golf course. And describe your state of mind and the best day that you've ever had on the golf course, but you can only use one word. Well, in all that time that I've been asking that, nobody's ever said that I was I was positive or, or anything like that. They've, they've always said 
the mind is quiet and the mind is calm, the mind is still. Those are the universal words that come back when people describe their best experiences. So it's, it's actually a reduction of thinking, not an, not an increase in thinking that we're after. We know, we know what it is. We know, we know what produces good golf. But yet an awful lot, unfortunately, an awful lot of the way people go about instructing themselves or instructing others actually increases thinking. It increases brainwave frequency, taking us away from our ability to, to get the best out of our game. Yeah. Let's take another time out. We'll be right back. When you worked with Fred Shoemaker, was that going there as a, uh, it's not, you know, it's not, um, are, were you going there to work with him individually or did you go to an extraordinary golf uh, seminar? What was it that no, drew I you went to Fred? There, yeah, I went there as a student, uh, went and, and joined him with the, with the school. 10, 15 other guys were there, which was, which was a great experience. Um, but I just, I just, I just went with a very much an open mind of trying to discover something. I'd read Fred's books, but the actual experience of being at the golf school was, um, you know, the, you, you, there's no substitute for that. And I think that's what yeah. COVID reinforced for us, isn't it? When we were separated from everybody for two years, you know, Z Zoom is nice and, you know, information on YouTube is nice, but there's no, there's no substitute really for the, 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 the connection of one-to-one -one and seeing people and, groups and things like that so you know i i I'd, I'd done a lot of exploration before that school but fred's school really kind of cemented some of the ideas in, in in my mind that if we ignore the mental side of the game fred we're missing a huge part of it it's not it's not to dismiss improvement in terms of the way that you apply the golf club to the ball we need to work on that but if we miss the mental side of it we're just missing a huge huge element and that's why i think so many people are frustrated because you know, they've been given so much technical information, but it just doesn't transfer onto the golf course. I love the way Fred talks about when he'll speak to a thousand PGA teaching professionals and say, anybody here, you know, they're all very, very low handicap, scratch or plus handicap. It's like, how many here are happy mm. about what they're doing? And mm. it's like, no, everyone's frustrated. They want to be better. They want to do better. They know they can make the last one. And it's like, you're missing the point. See, that again is another great point to raise because what is another illusion that we have with golf is that I'll be happy when. Yeah. I'll be happy when I play well. I'll be happy when I get my handicap down. I'll be happy when I get on the PGA Tour. I'll be happy when I win a major. Unfortunately, if you're waiting for golf to make you feel happy, you're going to be waiting most of your life. Because it doesn't, it doesn't tend to deliver when you when you're actually pleading with it to make you happy. <laughs> and pleading is the right word. And pleading is the right word. But again, the more I understand this, is that you know, from a brain perspective, there's two big players. There's dopamine and cortisol. Dopamine is your feel good chemical in your brain. Cortisol is your stress hormone. When cortisol is present. It's very hard to concentrate. It's very hard to focus. It's very, very difficult to coordinate movement. When dopamine is present, all of those things are much easier to do. Basically, when dopamine is present, you're happy. So I call it going first. The mm -hmm. idea that instead of waiting for golf to make you feel good, what about setting yourself up where you actually engineer that you're happy and grateful for the opportunity to play? Now, I know that sounds a bit tree huggy and left field and all the rest of it, but actually there's a lot of a lot of science would tell us that is an optimum state to play golf from. So instead of instead of constantly falling into the trap of I'll be happy when, what about the answer to the question, what what are you grateful for today? Because you know, the number one thing I've spoken to an awful lot of sports men and women who don't play anymore because of injury and age and all the rest of it what was the number one thing that people who used to play sport want to do they would love to go back and play again yeah and we take every single round we take it for granted you know you think of all the things that have to conspire for you to go and play golf the work that goes into the golf course your own health other people the world itself i mean 
I, I had a, um, I've got a young Ukrainian boy that I work with, a, you know, top, top amateur golfer, you know, and, and he's been telling me about his grandfather is in Ukraine. And, you know, the war, obviously the war's going on. And you just think, well, this, this can't happen in the modern world. Yeah. But it has, and it is. And, you know, what golf courses they have in, in, in Ukraine now are, are no longer. Nobody's playing golf, obviously. You know, and you just think, well, wow, six months ago, they would have been doing everything that we're doing now. They would have been going to restaurants and going to work and going to the gym and all of those things. And then suddenly the world says, ah, uh-uh, no, we're not having that anymore. Yeah. You know, and it's, without, without sounding preachy about it, I just think it's that the concept of gratitude is such a powerful thing to look into, not just because it makes you feel good anyway, but it helps you play better. It's interesting because uh, uh, gratitude is one of the things that I wrote down for us to discuss today. Um, not because not only because in your book, but you know, it's your, on your website. But it's an important part of your presentation, and you talk about Ukraine and gratitude. My grandparents were in, born in the Ukraine and right. run out of the country uh, just about a hundred years ago. And, you know, talk about gratitude is here I am in you know, 21st century United States uh, where I could have easily been still there. We still could have been there and been persecuted. Um, my grandmother told this incredible story that we share every year with our family about how she was forced to leave her family and never saw them again when she was a teenager um, because yeah. the Russians were... <laughs> The Russians were coming in and killing everybody in the village. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and you know, we we think missing a three foot putt to yeah. get the handicap down is the end of the world, and it real it really isn't. And that's not that's not to belittle the idea of trying to improve, Fred. It's not to belittle the idea of wanting to be the best golfer that you can be, but it's understanding a little bit deeper on a deeper level what is going to allow you to do that because. If your happiness is dependent on a golf score, if your sense of self-worth is dependent on where a golf ball goes, it's a pretty tough game to play. It's kind of like you're one shot from insanity all the time. <laughs> and, and yet, you know, you look, at, mm. you look at the actual act of going to a golf course. You know, you, dr- you drive down the, down the road and you turn into a beautiful environment. Right. But we stop seeing that. Stop seeing that it's a beautiful environment because the golf course can become a place of threat. Mm. That you go out there and, and all of a sudden, the, you, the way that your brain contextualizes the golf course is that that outer bounds and that water are all threats to your sense of self, your your, your value as a human being. Now. You know, as I said, these are some deep questions to, to look, for everybody to look at. But when, when you can start to sort of see that if you can turn that around and see that change it and, and create the context that this, this environment called golf is an immense privilege to go into, then you change the reference point. Now, all of a sudden, if the golf course becomes a friendly place, you can see the outer bounds and the water as a place to help you shape your shots into that the outer bounds and the water are creating a frame for you to create shots within. You know, and as I say, a lot of people are thinking, oh, it sounds a bit fanciful, all of this. But I think unless we address some of these things, you know, the, the, the endless frustrations will remain that we that we, 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 we so much come up short of realising a, a true potential at the game. Because the context is everything. The context that you create in terms of the golf course, the movements that you make will reflect the context that you create in your mind. Absolutely. It's one of the reasons I prefer to walk on a golf course mm. than taking a cart or a buggy. Um, just because it allows me to appreciate the golf course so much more. Because I, I see that when I'm in a golf cart, it, the tendency is to hit the ball, go to the ball, hit the ball, go to the ball. And there's so much more that I'm missing. And, and I, you know, I know that some people, well, they're medically or just whatever reason that they have to take a golf cart or even in the fact that somebody who may 
uh, be on their feet or walking all week long for work and they just want to sit and relax. Mm. That's okay. I'm not slamming you for doing that. But there's just an appreciation that you get of the sky and the water and the ground and everything else around you and the trees and the birds and the wildlife when you're walking through a golf course. And, and the other thing as well with this, Fred, again, it's an, and it's a performance element, is that if you look at the game, unique as well in the sense that 90% of the time that you're on a golf course, you're not playing golf. Right. You know, 90% is non-golf. 10% roughly is. Mm. How on earth can 90% not have some influence on 10? Please. But, but we don't look at it, do we? We don't look at, you know... I would imagine there's not many golfers go to the pro and say, I want you to help me on what I do in the 90% of time that I play golf that I'm not playing golf. Can you imagine what the teacher would do with, with a question like that, though? Most instructors well, would look at you like, what? What the hell are you on about? <laughs> but but if, you, if, if, you, if you looked at any other sport and said, well, 90% of my sport is this and 10% of it is that, Oh well, we'll just ignore the ninety percent and focus on the ten. <laughs> Any coach said that, that was crazy. That's ridiculous. You're absolutely right. Yeah. But but most I, I would have to say that most teachers aren't equipped to deal with that. No, and and as you say, they never get asked that question. And then you look at the environment that most coaching takes place, and it takes place on a range where you don't have the ninety percent. Right. Because on the range, there is no 90% because you hit a ball and there's another one waiting for you. So hit another one and hit another one and hit another one and hit another one. That's not golf. It's, it's a segment of golf. But, you, you know, you look, at, you look at what most people do in the 90% of the time that they're on the golf course. And the way that the brain works, it's usually a combination of regretting the past and dreading the future. Oh, <laughs> So true. You know, I should have done this. I should have done that. I should have all that put. I should have blah, 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 blah. Or if I can only just par the next and I'll birdie the par 5 16th. And if I'm birdie par 5 16th, oh, yeah. I've got it. Up, and all that kind of stuff that goes on. Well, what about if we looked at the 90% as a wonderful opportunity to train yourself to be a little bit more present to your experience? to be a little bit more tuned into what is going on right now. We, we've, we all hear about how mindfulness is good for us and meditation and things like that. Well, what about, what about if, if golf was a great laboratory for that, where you actually, look, where you actually looked at the 90% and said, okay, I've got, a, I've got a choice when I play next time. I can either get stressed about what I should have done and worried about what I might do, or I could maybe do something like tune into my senses. I've had a, a number of tour players over the years, simple procedures, they're walking in between shots to say to them, okay, can you really tune in to the feeling of your feet as you're walking along? And they look at me as I'm crazy. And I said, well, give it a go, see what happens. And I, I could, you know, I won't name names, but I could reel off a couple of, you know, tournament winners who that's what they've got good at in between shots is, wow. really, is really tuning into the feeling of their feet as they're walking along. Now then, People go, well, what, what the hell's that going to do with performance? Well, I would imagine most golfers, when they played good golf, will say that the rhythm in their swing is pretty good. On, on your good days, Fred, I would imagine the, the rhythm in the swing feels pretty good. Yes. Well, I've always been interested. What throws that rhythm? What is it that gets us out of rhythm? Well, I'm pretty convinced that the way that you walk in between shots has a major contributory factor to the rhythm that you swing the golf club. What do, what do most people do when they get agitated or get nervous? They speed up. The walk speeds, speeds up. up. Everything speeds up. So if you're walking quicker in between shots, don't expect your transition from backswing to death swing to be smooth. Hmm. Excellent point. Excellent point. Let's take one more time out and we'll be right back. You mentioned mindfulness. Um, and, you know, it, it brings me back to Dr. Joe Parent, who, mm. who talked about, you know, you, you should all over yourself, <laughs> right? Mm. And, and um, 
you know, of course, Zen golf uh, seems to start the whole mindfulness craze all over the world in every aspect of life. But there is an element to it of being present and being mindful when you're on the golf course and the rhythm of your walk, you know, whether you're, you're singing a song to yourself or not, or maybe there's music playing, which I'm not a big fan of, but it sure seems to be happening, happening more and more because I have a rhythm in my head. And if that music is not in the same rhythm, it really kind of throws me. But let's talk about mindfulness for a moment and how, how important that is to your well-being on a golf course. Well, if you look at what mindfulness is, mindfulness is being basically tuned into your actual current experience, non-judgmentally, just, just being aware of where you are right now, um, being aware of your, your current sensations, the, the rise and fall of your breath. If you are you know, eating mindfully is, is a really good idea for most people because we, in, in the Western world we don't eat mindfully. We shovel food down our throat as a, as a means to get another meal out of the way and then we can move on to the next thing that we need to do. To, to eat mindfully is to really tune into the sensations of, of, of eating the food. But on a, on, a, on a golf course, what are we looking to do on any individual shot? What would be the perfect way to play the game would be to come to a golf shot and this particular golf shot doesn't have a past, it doesn't have a future, it's just a unique moment in time. Now, when it's a unique moment in time, what we do is we then tune into the messages the golf course is giving us. Because the golf course is giving us all sorts of clues about what shot it's asking you to play right now. The wind direction, the lie, the pin position, all those kind of things are giving you clues of what shot to create. Now, if, if we're mindful, if we're very present to our experience, we tune into those cues. If we're, if we're over this shot and thinking, well, I've got to get this on, a, on the green because it's a par five and I definitely need to make birdie because I've just dropped one on the last, well, good luck with tuning into the golf course. Mm -hmm. But being mindful is, is an inherently pleasurable exercise because most of our life we're just filled with thoughts one thought after another usually as we've already said about the past or the future now whenever we're really engaged in the present moment be that in a good conversation a good film or a good book or something like that it is it's not it's not the it's not the book really or the film that makes us feel good it's the fact that we were present to it for a period of time that we right. suspend all the noise inside of our head yep. so um you know i, I think mindfulness can be misleading in the sense that a lot of people perhaps think you know you need to sit cross-legged and, and chant and all the kind of to be mindful no you can be mindful at any point you can you know you can be in a queue at the at the, at the bank or whatever and a queue in for a you know a train wh wherever it may be you can be you can be mindful in those situations as opposed to just lost in thought i've found for myself personally the places that i i can uh, get into a mindful state or even a meditative state is mm. swimming yeah, or um, walking the golf course. Yeah. I yeah. found that I, that to me is much more calming and peaceful than just sitting. I have monkey mind too much. And so I'm, sitting is difficult. I'm the same. What I try and do every day is, is go for a walk, but I try and walk mindfully. In the way that I've in the way that I've said it, I'll, I'll I'll set off for a walk, and decide to pay attention to my breath, as I'm mm. walking along. And you know, Fred, some days I can stay with the breath, and I can I can seemingly walk for you know minutes on end and stay with it. And then other days the minds are jumping all over the place. But you just gently keep bringing it back, keep bringing it back. So people could look at this and sort of say, "Well, wow, I ac I actually could go for a walk every day." And that walk could be a great way of working on my golf game. Because yep. you could just go for a walk for 10 minutes and practice being present to the sensation of your breath or the feeling of your feet, as we've already already mentioned. That can then transfer into your golf when you go and play. You can be better at the 90% then. It's one of the good things about owning a dog is you have to take them for a walk every day. But then your they focus report. is on where they pooped. They, they <laughs> 
They require that whether you like it or not. It, <laughs> right, exactly. And, and we um, um, and we think that we own the dog, but it doesn't. It's not doesn't work that way, does it? <laughs> the other way around. Who's the boss? Who's the boss? Exactly. There's Who's only the one boss? boss with a dog. Well, I was looking at your website, themindfactor.net. Dot com. Yeah. Dot net, yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, I went to dot com and it didn't log in, but I went to dot net and it worked. So anyway, the mind factor, the mind factor dot yeah. pick your poison net or com. Um, one of the things in one of your seminars, you talk about everybody having a story or your story. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated. Can you dig into that a little bit for me? Yeah, we as as humans, Fred, we're all just a collection of stories in the sense that we we create a narrative about ourselves, a, a narrative related to our abilities and, and, and capabilities. Um, probably the most influential book that I've ever read was a book called Redirect by a guy called Timothy Wilson, who's a Harvard professor of psychology. And, and he talked in depth in, in Redirect about the stories that we live by. And unfortunately, what happens with a story is that if we repeat a story enough times, it becomes our reality. So that we can we can have the poor putter story or the bad chipper story or whatever, and, and the story grows legs. The more times we relate the story, the more times we tell other people and all of that kind of stuff. So for me, one of the big things is to, for any golfer, if they want to improve, is to really look at your current story. An exercise I would get players to do is to write out in detail what is your current golf story. How do you describe yourself as a golfer? How do you talk to you, how do you talk about yourself as a golfer? What are the patterns that you tend to run? Get a really clear description of that current story, and then see how clearly, when you've written it down, how clearly most of that stuff is just made up. It's not reality. It's just your reality. Now, the great thing about a story is if, if you've created one story, you can potentially create another story. So after you've created the current story, then you can start to write it. Oh, okay, what story would you like to be? What, what story would you like to have in the future? If you've been this miserable, unhappy golfer on the, for, for years, that's been your story. What story would you need to create to be a more appreciative and grateful player? And then when you've created the new story, your brain has got a map to move towards. So instead of, I call it being the director, not the actor, an actor just follows a script. And most of us are just actors because we're following a script that we've created. A, direct, a, a director says, oh, no, no, we don't want that. We don't want that scene in the film. Let's create a different scene. So by being a director, you actually create a new story and then you start to live towards that story. It's very different than just goal setting, just goal setting. You know, I, want to win, I want to win the monthly medal. I want to get down to scratch and all that kind of stuff. That has very little impact. When yeah, because what happens we now and then? Yeah. You know, um, Jordan Peterson has a great program called, it's called the Future Authoring Suite or the, um, the Past Authoring Suite. That's a great thing, for, a great resource for people to look at on his website. And it, it's exactly this, what we're talking about. He, you know, you write out in detail the, the, the past story, you write out in detail your current story, and then you create a future story. And it's a really powerful exercise to sort of sit down and just become that director of the, of the, of the movie rather than just the plain old actor. It's so great to have you on. I, I love having these conversations with you, but you also have your own podcast. We, yes, let's I do. promote I, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still, uh, still keep hanging in there. I'm not anywhere near as many episodes as you, Fred, but I think we're we're, we're past we're past two hundred now, which is not a bad effort. I That's don't think. Excellent, but... excellent. Well, I got a head start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's called the Brain Booster. Uh, that's how it's each each Friday, and we've. Uh, had some pretty good guests on there over over the years. Izzy Justice, who kindly came on the show, and he's been on a couple of times. He's a great, great. You know, he talked about the neuroscience of putting. The last show that was just out, which was a great episode. So, Fred Shoemaker's been on, and Mike Hebron, and a bunch of tour players that I've worked with over the years, Ryan Fox, and um, you know Graham McDowell, players like that. So, yeah, we've, uh, we keep we, we we keep going. It's out every week. The Brain Booster. That's great. Congratulations. Happy for you that you're doing it. Um, you had some pretty awesome guests too, but you have access. That's great. That's great. Well, we've also, if I can just mention it, Fred, we've also got, uh, as a backup to the Brain Booster, we've got an app called the, the Mind Caddy, 
and it's it's a pretty good support for anybody listening there's a free version of it where it actually allows you to keep a mental score i think there's many apps like that where you can actually keep a mental and you get a mental game score depending on the work that you put into your mental game there's an algorithm in the there's an algorithm in the app that works it all out depending on on what you've done so you can kind of keep a track of what you're doing there's some journaling elements to it so it's a it's a pretty good support to the uh, to the brain booster the mind caddy c-a-d-d-y yeah the mind caddy excellent yeah. i'll look into that absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. Well, Carl, again, the book, the, uh, the Lost Art of the Short Game, is the third and final entry into the Lost Art of Golf books from Carl Morris and Gary Nicole. And I really appreciate you coming on the show again and talking to me and expanding my mind to the whole course and not just yeah. the shot. The 90%, not just the 10 No, it's been great to chat, Fred. I always enjoy the conversations. They always go in some interesting directions. So... Uh... Tonight's been great.